So we're down to forensic data imaging. And this is the classic computer forensic. So you have some kind of computer device and you want to get the data off it um, for any purpose. Um, here we're more focused on the instant response, but I say sometimes when you do your R, you decide that there are certain machines that are so important, you really need all the data off that machine. And then you'd go here. So you can just copy select the data. Uh, you can do a forensic duplicate, which copies every bit on the source. Every bit from every part of the hard drive is typically what you think of, although the same thing would apply to RAM. And uh, the point is, if you copy the whole hard drive, you can then recover the deleted files. So if you've got to have a tool that can account for everything, create a forensic duplicate, and it has to handle read errors. This is a big issue with magnetic hard drives, um, and unfortunately also SSDs. Sometimes you read and get an error, and a lot of normal copy routines will just stop at that point. Forensic tools have to keep going and get you whatever data is possible from the machine. Um, so you have to not change the one you're reading, and you have to generate re repeatable results. These are the standard old rules for hard drives. This is, of course, meaningless for RAM. There is no possible way to get data from RAM without changing it. And when you do it again, you get a different answer. So this stuff can't happen. But you do want to make logs that keep track of what you did and log any errors. And this is the issue of every bit. You don't use every bit to store data, not at all. Um, there is a um, there are deleted files, there are bad sectors, which are not addressed by your book, but they're a big issue. Um, there are bad clusters, which contain fragments of old data and cannot be erased or recovered by normal tools. And then there's the host protected area, which is where the firmware that runs the hard drive lives. Yeah? Can that be accessed? It cannot be accessed by normal file copies. You have to have some kind of special tool to get it. Um, there was a tool called ProDiscover that was real proud of its ability to do this, but it seems to have vanished. Um, and another way to do it, Travis uh, Goodspeed does this, is hacking the firmware in the hard drive. They're replacing it with hacked firmware that lets you get all the data. Um, what would be the benefit, you know, of, uh, of if you're trying to get information? The host, is there anything valuable in the host protected area? That's a very good question. Is there anything valuable in there? In principle, there should be nothing there except the firmware that runs the hard drive, which came from the manufacturer. But you could, of course, if your criminal is so computer savvy, they could hack the firmware and then store secret data over there, and you'd never know. So this is why ProDiscover tried to market their product, saying our product is better than other stuff like NCASE and FTK, because we get in here, and technically they could get in there. But in practice, I heard from people in the field that they never actually found anything in there that was important. So it, it turned out not to be important in practice, because no significant number of criminals actually hid secrets in there, so what was the point? I remember when I first started doing the hacking the window uh, Commodore 64 games many years ago, uh, they would hide stuff in this area and I found out how to read and write to that area and modify it and stuff. It was pretty easy back in the old days of floppy drives. And the main thing you'd put there is a special routine to make it impossible to copy the disk. You couldn't copy a game because they would have a special copy routine in here and a check in here and so any normal copy wouldn't copy that area and you wouldn't get a good copy of the game. So you had to figure that out, which was pretty interesting. Anyway. So when you get your forensic image, there are various ways to do it. Uh, now, there are two different groups of image types. This determines what kind of data you get. It's a whole drive, a whole partition, or a logical selection, which is a certain group of files according to some criteria. A complete disk image is, of course, every bit in the area where you can store files, including the master file table, the boot sector, all the partitions, the partition tables, you know, every addressable part of the hard disk, which does not include the host protected area, that's what you would copy. And in a simple case, which seems to be the only one addressed by your textbook, which is old disks less than 500 gigabytes in size, you could actually copy the entire hard drive because the addressing was one-to-one. -one. So when you try to read sector 10,000, you're actually reading sector 10,000. When hard drives got bigger <coughs> than 500 gigabytes in size, um, the failure rate of sectors got so large that they had to make them self-healing. And the same thing is true of SSDs. So that if you buy a 500 gigabyte hard drive, they really give you some extra, like 550 gigabytes. And they silently map. If a sector fails, they silently replace it with another one. So that when you try to read sector 10,000 and it gets a read error, it'll move that data to another area and then remap it on 10,000. So when you think you're reading 10,000, you're not. You're reading another one. So when you read every addressable sector and copy it, you're not really getting all the data on the disk. And Travis Goodspeed told me in private communication that from a one terabyte hard drive, he was able to retrieve 50 megabytes of good data after complete forensic erase. Because the same thing is true of an erase. All you do is erase every addressable sector, and your computer does not know that there are sectors of the hard drive that can't see. 
it writes to every sector from one to a million or whatever, and there are other ones that are not currently in use, but were in use before, and when they were marked bad, that doesn't mean all the data was gone, it just means it found one read error when it read it. So the old data is still there, with perhaps a few bits dead, and uh, there's no way to erase it at all unless you can reverse engineer the hard drive and replace the firmware. So this is why um, the standard for businesses and police departments and everybody else has always been you physically grind up the drive in a wood chipper or something. You never trust any erasing tool to really erase it. And that is a very wise procedure because there is nothing you can use that will really get 100% of the data off. How and do you do that, thing, Sam? What's that? How do you do it? How do you get all the data off? Yeah. The only way I know is to reverse engineer the hard drive and, and replace the firmware <coughs> with modified firmware. So you don't, you don't take a hammer to it? There's oh, 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 no, if you want to physically destroy it, anything that physically destroys it would be fine. Shatter the, the, the platters with a hammer, a wood chipper works, um, grinder works, um, any of those things. Anything that physically... What do you do? Oh, I've never had this problem. I don't have any confidential data worth a damn. Um, I just erase them and go on. Can you, yeah. can you uh, do, an, do an image, chunk it out to multiple drives or even to the cloud, and is it good evidence as such? Well, they're going to get there, but that is, of course, a huge issue. Drive arrays and data put in the cloud server and everything else, you can probably no longer make physical images of those things. But you can get logical images and use them. And the data, any data is good. In court? Sure. In, in the, none of the technology matters in court. In court, the people are the evidence. You come there, with, like I said, one, I mentioned last time, cops, there was a time when there was a cell phone. Cop needed to get data off the cell phone, so he just paged through the messages and took photographs with a Polaroid camera. Yeah. That's evidence. He said, I went to the crime scene, I found this thing, this was the data on there. It's not like mathematically perfect or anything, but it is evidence found on the device. The evidence in court is the cop testifying and saying, I saw it, and they had their credibility. So it, it doesn't have to be a perfect process to be admissible in court, but it does have to be reasonably competent or the opposing examiner will tear you to bits, saying, you're a moron, why did you do it wrong? You destroyed the evidence, you didn't measure it correctly, you used out-of-date tools what an idiot you are, and that may humiliate you to where you lose credibility in court. So the real point is there's no simple rule that you must use certain tools or certain procedures to be admissible in court. What you must do is you must be able to defend what you did and impress the judge and jury with your competence and say there was a good reason to do it this way and I can explain it clearly. That's what has to happen. Then you're convincing in court. Because you almost never have a perfect procedure. Something almost always goes wrong. As all of us would know, when you try to do these projects or you try to um, to solve a CTF problem or you try to fix a broken device, almost never does everything work out the way you want. Various things go wrong along the way, mistakes are made, and you do not have to be perfect. You just have to be able to defend what you did, and people have to decide that you sound competent, sound like you know what you're doing. So, so, yeah. so I was coming from the government side, yeah. I mean, do, do, try, not trying to hide uh, evidence. Of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Trying to find and it after somebody else tried to hide it, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's mostly what you're doing. You're trying to find stuff that, that somebody else did not want you to find. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to d destroy evidence. So it's... Right. But however, there is such a thing as erasing stuff because you have to, like, you know, you have confidential data on there. You're supposed to be able to pass on the computer to someone and believe it's gone. And that's an issue here. That is not so easy. Anyway, so as I mentioned, we've done a real FTK Imager. FTK Imager gives you this choice here. You can do the whole physical drive. You can do a logical drive or an image file where you're reading a file or the contents of a folder. There are various types of collection you can do. And then when you collect it, you can put it in a variety of different formats. DD is the simplest, and there's other ones like E01, which is Expert Witness, and AFF, Advanced Forensic Format. So if the suspect attempts to hide data by deleting things, reinstalling the OS, reformatting, then none of those really erase every sector on the disk. So a lot of data is still there, but you are only going to retrieve that data if you do a whole drive image because the, it's in the sectors that are no longer connected to the master file table. They no longer have an owner, a file name, and a starting block. The data is still there, but they no longer are tied to the directory. So so you have to need a tool that can, your tool will attempt to reconstruct the, the sectors, rebuild the files. And you're only going to be able to do that with a whole drive image or, to a lesser extent, a whole partition image. But you, if you do a logical image, which is going through the directory and picking out files that meet some condition, then you will never be able to recover deleted files because it works from the directory. It only catches what's called active data. Active data is data that is in use in the file table owned by somebody with a creation date still in use. 
um, latent data is data that has been deleted from the file table, but it's not yet erased in the partition. So data is just left over on the disk. And latent data can be reconstructed by forensic tools to some extent, but it's always a random process because parts of it are getting erased by later files that go on. Dave, see, I must cut yeah. to the chase. How many people in your industry know how to actually find that 10% of latency? Oh, almost everybody does. It's so common. You very often want to find deleted files because it's extremely common that the suspect finds out you're onto them and they delete everything. They empty the recycle bin. That is a common move. And so everyone expects to blow through that. In, in, in your industry, how many people know how to find that, uh, well, uh, that um, stuff? Every, every forensic examiner knows how to find it. All well, your tools do it automatically. Awesome. Yeah, nobody, nobody would ever consider not doing that. The only point, so what, uh, if you do a whole drive image, your forensic tool, like FTK or Encase, will just automatically have a folder called Reconstructed uh, Deleted Files. And you frequently look in there. So that's normal behavior. Yeah? With like a, like a file shredder that uses like DOD standard sure. work? Sure. Yeah, things like boot and nuke, um, file shredders, you don't even need multiple passes. If you do even one pass, writing zeros over the whole drive, then you can't recover anything. Without doing something really exotic like I was talking about, uh, which is almost never done. So if you write the whole drive with zero with just, um, in Windows, just um, disk part, select disk, clean all, then nobody will get any deleted files off that with any standard forensic tool. That is all a perp has to do, but in fact, many people do not know that, so they throw it in the trash can, empty it, and think it's gone, which is not. It's very easy. You can also just download freeware. Erasure is one that will just erase the whole drive, too. It takes an hour or two to erase a whole drive. And people don't, and it only takes a few seconds to empty the recycle bin because the reason it's fast is because it's not cleaning off the data. It's just removing the data from the, the uh, directory. Yeah? Why don't they just open the file, delete all the stuff inside? That's still, well, how do you delete the stuff inside? You mean like open it in Notepad and yeah. delete all the contents? Yeah. You could do that and then save the revised version, and that would not get rid of the old data. It would make another copy of it in new sectors without the contents, but the old copy would still be there. But that's what you want to do is delete the sectors one by one, and that's what tools like Erasure do. But there's no shortcut. It'll take hours, and that's why it's not popular. There are even some products you can install on the disk, like steganography, that will stay there all the time, and from now on, every time you delete a file, it will also erase the sectors. Therefore, every delete operation will get slower, but some people do that, and that's something you might do in like a military base or something where you want to make sure that leftover stuff is not hanging around. Yeah? Can you uh, data carve on iOS stuff, like phones? Yes, you can, in principle, data carve on iOS. Um, the problem is, however, everything is encrypted on iOS right from the start, and you will have to defeat that. And uh, I think, but I think the expensive tools they sell you will handle that. It's a very good question. So the host protected area we talked about and device configuration overlay, these are the parts that are drive reserved for the drive firmware. So normally there's nothing the suspect put there and you normally can't recover them, but you know, you, you can hide root kits there, and in principle, a perp could hide secrets in there. It's just not commonly done, and they're hard to recover, although not impossible. Sam, have you yeah. ever done it? No, I've never done that. I think um, might have done it once as a demonstration of a Pro Discover feature years ago. Are you a good man? And I say I did it way back in the days of floppy disks, um, the kind of floppy disk in Commodore, but not. I've never found anything important there. Anyways, active data is the main thing you do. These are data files that are currently in use, that are owned by somebody. Unallocated space is areas available for new files, and what's in there is the leftover stuff from old files. Yeah? Active data, is that live data? Still uh, it is active in the sense that it is uh, going to be accessed somewhere in the file system, and it will not be overwritten as you save new files. So it's, it's, still, it's static, but it's still... Yeah, it's reserved. It's in the, in the directory, owned by somebody, and considered the operating system knows there should be a file there, so it won't put new data on there oh. unless you delete it first. That's why This is why most people think that deleting files, which render them not inactive, is enough to mean you can't find them because you can no longer find them by opening my computer and clicking on things. It's gone from that list. You'll never find it in any folder anymore after you delete it, and that's why most people think that data is gone. But all you've done is turn it into unallocated space which is at stays available for new files, but until you put a new file on it, it remains unerased, which is just a question of efficiency. In so order this to- This is kind of re recurrent uh, kind of uh, information from you. How do you yeah. get this stuff off the hard drive? Uh, all you do is um, you, you can do it, first you do an image with an imaging tool like FTK Imager, which copies it all, and then you analyze that image with a tool like FTK or NCASE, which will automatically reconstruct it. 
So yeah, it, yeah, I'm going to need to. I'm going to need this information. Oh yeah, sure. But that's, that's fine. It, it, but this is a uh, this is automatically done by tools these days, where most um, forensic examiners I talk to can't even really explain exactly what's happening in any great detail because they don't care. The tool just does it. It'll just give you a folder that says deleted files. What it's actually got in there is an attempt to reconstruct the files, and what it usually does is something incredibly simple. It hunts through the headers for a known file header, like a JPEG file header, and if it finds one, it just takes contiguous sectors from then on, assumes they're all in order, there's no fragmentation, until it finds the end and calls that an image. So you'll see like broken images, or half of this image and half of that image, but it just, just does the simplest thing to try to reconstruct it. And there was another tool whose name I've forgotten, that actually tried much more complicated procedures to reconstruct images. And so it was able to reconstruct images a little more accurately and get like 10% more images. But again, nobody would pay for it. Nobody cared. Because in practice, it doesn't really matter. Um, whether you find 90% of the kitty porn or 100% of the kitty porn, the guy still goes to jail. So. What do you do it, Sam? You use the tool or you just uh, uh, you do it uh, manually? Oh, I use these tools, yeah. I, I had some project, I'm not sure I put it in this, in my French of course, I had a project with NTFS data runs where you actually do this manually. And it's really quite burdensome, where you actually organize the sectors and go through them and reconstruct them. That's why you're seeing how the tool works. And I, I think it's not that important for us. But yeah, it is, um, if you want to learn this, you go to Brian Carrier's book. Yeah, so everyone here, uh, Sam uses tools. Of course, of course. Yeah. You use the tool, it gets the job done. Yeah. Anyway, so then there's file slack. Now, file slack is kind of madness. Um, you cannot read or write an arbitrary amount of data to a disk. You can only read or write uh, 512 bytes. This has been true since the day of floppy drives, and it continues to be true. So if you want to save a file that is 520 bytes long, you have to fill one 512-byte sector, and then you put just a few bytes in the next sector. And when you do that, there is leftover stuff from the previous file in that sector up to 500 bytes of it. So um, that's called file slack, fragments of leftover frag. These are never going to be complete files, but there might be something useful in there, like a password or a fragment of text from some message or something. Uh, that stuff is usually not recovered by normal forensic tools. It's, it's quite hard to find. You really can't do anything with that stuff except search for keywords, because you don't even have file headers. You can't reconstruct images. You've got fragments of a file, and you're always missing the first few bytes, which are the essential part to reconstruct it. But so that's often neglected. And I don't know how important it is either. Um, it's not so much an issue as far as a crop finding crime. It's more important for someone who wants to tell people, you, you can reuse this hard drive, and I'm sure my password is not still on the hard drive. The problem is it could be over there. Same thing's true with USB sticks. I have a bag of USB sticks in my office that I've had for years because I had a students do projects in various classes, finding out if there was some secure way to erase them. And as far as any of us have ever been able to figure out, there is no way to securely erase them. For this reason. Army got rid of those uh, ten years ago. Yep. Yeah, yep. there's no no USB uh, uh, portal in any military system. Yeah, yeah, USB is pretty sloppy, and as far as I can tell, as USB sticks, you can never get 100% of the data off. All you can ever get is about 99%, and the question is, is that good enough? And it's really probably it's not. I'm retired. I've, I've been out of the army for ten years. But, yeah. 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 Anyway, so. Uh, then there's, you can take a partition image where you have your drive partitioned into like C, D, E, and F, and you do just one partition. You could do that, and then you get the deleted files on that one partition, but it's kind of strange and not commonly done. This is what's quite commonly done on large volumes is a complicated drive arrays is a logical image where you choose certain files from the directory. Um, this is done if you're using some kind of shared volume. And, uh, so, for example, you might have a court order that only lets you get the evidence for one person. So you're only going to have like some shared server. So you only want one person's data. So all you can do is go to the directory and get the files owned by that person and copy them. And you won't get any deleted stuff because when you delete stuff, you lose the directory information. So you no longer know who owns it. So it would not be legal for you to collect it. And this is what you typically have to do. So that's the game for large drive arrays. Um, or, all right. And uh, then you want to save what you can, all the information about it. Um, these tools can collect them. You can also just write your own script. I mean, this is no more than a backup now. You just have a list of files, grab each file and copy it somewhere else. I've done it with simple bash scripts, but you can use these tools also. It's, uh, all right, Sam, so let's yeah. talk about the metadata. <coughs> yeah, well, the metadata is things like um, the file creation time and the owner. And you can get that with these tools. And you'll get it with a directory, too. And that's, of course, important. Anyway, 
Um, then there's non-standard data. Like I mentioned, you might get evidence that does not come, the forensic examiner did not collect it with a standard forensic tool. It came some other way, like somebody hands you a USB stick with data on it. Uh, you just get something in some strange way, like network capture files. You don't really know how it's collected. You could just refuse to take it, but that's not logical. I mean, if, you, if there's a crime and you walk down the crime scene and you find like something sitting on the ground and pick it up, it's evidence. You haven't collected it in a perfect way or anything, but it is evidence. You record, look, I got it by this technique. Now that I have it, now you can analyze it and it may be important. There is gonna be an issue of how is this collected? Is it really genuine and all that? But it's no different than Sam, the other evidence. I'm business right yeah. now. Is anyone using, a, 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 I'm showing my age right now. Is anyone using a USB sticks? Or a, a oh yeah, device? people use them all the time. Yeah, but yeah, they're still in use? Oh yeah, USB sticks are very handy for a lot of purposes. In fact, uh, okay. yeah. Anyway, Sorry to interrupt you, that's all right. So anyway, the thing to do when you get any weird data for any strange thing is just document it. Just record, here's what I got, here's what it is, and record it. You keep it, it may, people may later decide this data is no good for some reason, but that's not the issue of the forensic examiner. The forensic examiner's job is to get it all and record what you know so that the decision can be made later by people how important this is. It could turn out that what's on that is all important. Anyway, um, so you want to have image integrity. Uh, whatever you get, you'd like to keep a hash value so that if you make later copies of it, you know it hasn't been altered. Um, there are devices where you cannot do this, like SSDs. SSDs, the data is changing all the time because there's a background process erasing the unused sectors that keeps changing things. Devices with bad sectors give some random bits for some of the sectors, so you cannot get a reproductive hash. Uh, same hash twice, so again, just keep going. Say, well, I did it. I did the hash twice. It keeps changing. Here's the data. That's as good as it can get. So yeah. if you have to work on SSD, then there's no point in hashing that? Uh, probably not. There's probably no real point in hashing an SSD. You might do it anyway because it's convenient, but if you do it again, you'll get a different answer. It's like hashing a RAM image. If you then take another acquisition of RAM, you'll get a different answer because some timestamps have changed and such. So. Uh, the only point of creating a hash value is in case you're going to make two copies of the result, one for prosecution and one for defense. And you want to make sure those two copies are identical. So, but so <coughs> for, for some of our uh, uh, d dumber dan dumbasses here, uh, what, what do you uh, use to a hash? Oh, oh, uh, any any variety of tools will do. OpenSSL can hash, uh, Windows HashCalc can hash, and the uh, commercial forensic tools like NCase and FTK automatically create a hash. Good. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So here's some formats. AFF is Access Data's format, uh, the Advanced Forensic Framework. Expert Witness is the standard. People think this E stands for ENCASE because it's the format ENCASE uses, but actually an earlier program, product called the Expert Witness defined the format and ENCASE adopted it. Then Expert Witness seems to have vanished. And ENCASE is, this is the one they use. These both store MD5 and SHA-1 hashes automatically. And um, they're both compressed. So if you image a 500 gig hard drive, it will zip it, which will make it much smaller because most of the time, most of those sectors are blank and you don't need to make them full size. Another question, Sam. Yeah. I just I paid uh, uh, for, for a zip uh, tool. Should yeah. I pay for it or could I have gotten it free? Oh, there's perfectly good free zip tools. I wouldn't pay for any. Things like 7-Zip are very good. There's plenty of free zip tools. Which yeah. are the two, uh, Expert Witness and what was the other one? Expert Witness and Advanced Forensic Format. Yeah. Those, are the, okay. those are the common ones. Um, and they both are essentially the same in practice, but e Expert witness is the standard. That's what most people expect to see. But these both are mathematically identical. They have the same information. And DD is, again, mathematically identical. This is the uncompressed file. This is what you get with the Unix tool DD. It just copies every bit, bit by bit, to another file. So you have a 500 gig drive, you get a 500 gig file. And really, all those other tools do is make the DD file and then zip it. And in case, we'll then split it into pieces because I don't know if this is still true. I think it is still true. Windows file systems cannot handle big files. The largest file you can have in, um, if you, now NTFS can, but in the older one, which a lot of people are still using, um, you have to keep your files under four gigs or two gigs. So in case we'll split it up into two gig segments. That's the E01, E02, E03, and zip it. So the total file is a lot it's smaller. It's not going to become a problem, Sam. It's not a problem because it can re reconstruct it perfectly. It's like a zip file that's zipped into multiple files. It's all still the same data. It's just stuck in, the reason why you do that is because if you want to copy it to something like a USB stick, that's usually FAT32, and it cannot handle large files. Oh, so if you had a 100 gig file, you couldn't put it on a 200 gig USB stick. Oh, you need it to break it up in little chunks. Oh, anyway, that's the game. The DD file is the raw, naked, direct copy of the disk, the simplest thing. A D, the DD utility included in every Unix will do it. 
Um, you can also use this one from the Digital Computer Forensics Lab, and, and this will just do the DD and then add some hash values in another file. No big deal, really. Um, so whenever you have evidence you've collected, you should document it. Put in hashes and have a chain of custody, who collected it, who stored this somewhere, who stored the original data somewhere, the original hard drive or whatever, um, just like any other evidence. And you can choose a format. Um, they're all the same. You can take a DD file and turn it into an EO1. You can take EO1 turn it into AFF. They're mathematically identical, just like a zipped file and an unzipped file. They have the same information. Um, commercial Windows tools usually use expert witness files. Um, open source tools usually use DD files. That's all. But the two can be converted to each other. Yeah. I thought you had a question. Anyway, um, so I got a few cahoots about this stuff. Let me bring up Kahoot and Zoom. So the hidden part of the disk. Yeah, that's the host protected area. All right. Which one will let you recover deleted files? So this garbage. OK, a forensic image. OK. And? What type of acquisition will let you recover deleted files? So my, yeah. I figured if I hit raw image three times in a row, it would be correct at one point, and it never was. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Anyway, there's disk. you got to get the whole disk if you want the best chance. All right. And what kind of acquisition? We'll make sure that you get only the files owned by the suspect. That's a logical image. That's a logical condition. <laughs> Owned by a particular person. All right. And what kind of image is most likely to be accepted in court? They're all the same. They're all mathematically identical. So if somebody tries to tell you that you need one over the other, this is an opportunity to humiliate them and gain credibility compared to them. And this is the kind of thing where my favorite forensic teacher talked about how he always managed to humiliate the hell out of the other guy in court and gain credibility because they didn't know this simple stuff and he would explain it and then it would be clear that they're an idiot and I'm not an idiot, so listen to me, which is why they liked him. Anyway, um, so what kind of image is easiest to use with open source tools? All right, DD, the un uncompressed file is easiest. All right, uh, we still got some time, so let's do a bit more of these slides. All right, so traditional duplication. This is the way computer forensics was always done until about 10 years ago. Um, you would kick out the hard drive, kick out the plug, turn off the machine, forget about the RAM, and then image the hard drive. All the, you have a hard drive only is what you image. Power is off. You connect it to a duplicating device uh, through a bright protector, and then you make a copy of it. You could boot the suspect machine from a Linux DVD. That's one way to do it, which automatically protects it from writing and lets you do it on the existing hardware, or you take the hard drive out and connect it to another machine to duplicate it. Hardware write blockers. Um, back in the early days, you could just clip one wire on those old ribbon cables. But in modern things, you have to pay for one of these things, like a Tableau write blocker, which actually has about a gigabyte of memory and some software in it to lie to the computer and let it think that it is correcting, connecting to this drive in the usual way, but it does not change the drive in any way. If you boot up a machine and it touches a drive, it changes the data on the drive these days. It makes an entry in the journal, it updates some dates, it changes the t date on the trash can, it changes various bits on a drive every time you boot up. And that is not acceptable for forensic copies, so you pay for one of these write blockers, or you use a special distribution like a Linux distribution that won't do that. What's the interface? How much and where do you buy them? Uh, you can get them in a lot of places, and they cost about 300 bucks. It's very annoying. What's the interface? Uh, you have to specify when you buy the hardware, and if you're going to do a variety of different plugs, you have to buy a different one for each type. It's quite a lot of money you spend. Yeah? I bought one for a, one of Alan's class. Cool. Oh, really? For like $39. $39? Bucks. Wow. Was it USB Amazon. only? Was it USB? I forgot what it was. Yeah, usually USB ones are pretty cheap. No, it's not a USB. It was wow, was it? So it was probably oh, SATA or something? $39. $39. Bucks. That's really good. The ones last I knew, they cost like $300. You've had a good deal. It's a company oh, called Steel Gear. Cool gear. Cool gear. Right? Cool gear. Okay. Well, that's good. By the way, another good thing to do is test these now and then. So you can say you tested. This is one of Steve's ten rules. Always test your write blocker. Take his trash drive and try to write. Then you can go to court and make sure. Yeah. 
doesn't editing the registry also prevent anything from writing? You can try to edit the registry. This is a very good question. In Windows, you can edit the registry and block USB writing. The problem is this is not an official Windows feature, so you don't really know it's going to keep working as Windows updates, so you really have to test it. This is what um, really cheap people do. That's what I used to have students do in class. Um, is edit the registry sheet and use USB images. And it's pretty good, but I would have to, I really want to, if someone did that, I would really want them to say they tested it and made sure it worked. Um, that's, and your Linux distributions can be modified so they don't write at all. There's special forensic versions you use. And that would be a much safer way to do it. So what was the interface he was talking about? I don't know, you didn't specify. But I assume SATA or something. Yeah. How would you test it? Oh, you test it by getting a drive you don't care about and trying to write to it and then measure it, see if it got written to. That would be what I'd do. Anyway, so Tableau and Wybacheck are common ones. There's a lot of others. These are the big names, so they're expensive. They've been around forever. And uh, then, of course, Live DVD. Deft is one of them. I was fond of this one. I used it when I used to teach the normal forensics class. Uh, this one is from Italy. And the one thing about this one is it can image the MacBook Air, which is not easy to image. But anyway, there's a bunch of them. Kali had a version at one time, and there's a lot of Linux distributions that have been modified to not ever write at all to the disk. And this is one of the many that can boot into a forensic mode. Um, then you make the image with just DD or DD, DC3DD, your FTK imager or NCASE. Um, any of these tools are fine. Um, the main reason people like hardware disk duplicators is because they want to use a Windows tool like NCASE. And Windows does not have any easy modification that will stop it from writing to normal hard drives with SATA or PETA ports, which is what you want to use to get speed. So people pay for the hardware write blocker, and then they use a Windows tool like NCASE or FTK Imager. That's the most common arrangement. This is probably a very good idea because the most common reason why you foul this up is human error. You accidentally plug it in the wrong place. You forget to put in the hard drive. And so using software things like that registry hack, the problem is if it's not easy and simple, more of the higher percentage of the time, your staff will do it wrong. So paying for an expensive piece of hardware and a very nice Windows-based tool that everybody can easily use is probably a good investment in the long run. And that's why most people do it that way. Because human error is your biggest problem. And if, you want, and if you're going to use Linux, as you probably know by now, you've got to be really good at using Linux. It's very easy to make mistakes with Linux. In particular, with DD, with DD, you say copy from the input file to the output file. You can easily get them backwards and copy your drive onto the evidence. And there's nothing to stop. That's why you wish you had a hardware write blocker, so you'd know that wouldn't happen. What's a, what's a redirect? A uh, redirect? A uh, redirect is... How do you point it to, to your output file? Oh, you specify um, just IF equals and OIF equals, your input file and output file. But what people do, the, they do this all the time do is they just get a hardware duplicator. You plug in this drive here, the other drive there, and press the button. And, uh, do you ever yeah. do these um, acquisitions using the cloud? And then, if so, how would the write blocker work? Well, um, I'm not aware of a... Well, I am aware of this. You can do um, forensic... Um, in case forensic version, which costs 100 grand and is common at corporations, has the ability to live image over your corporate network. But it's not a forensic image. It's just a live acquisition. Um, you might acquire the whole drive, and then you might get some deleted files. But it is while the drive is in use, so it's a smear. But you, you, can, you can do it. And um, <coughs> I, it can be done. But you're not going to get this kind of perfection, because there isn't any right blog behind all that stuff. Anyway, um, so here's your issues. Is the source media right protected? This would be nice. Um, will the examination attempt to do something automatically? Like we said, um, if you don't have hardware write blockers, then you're going to have an issue of automatic processes, like updating the data on the journal. Um, do you have enough space for the output file? The output file, if you're not using it in a compressed format, it'll be as big as the input file. So you have to address it. You have to do some kind of command line commands if you're down to using these sort of things. That's why people try to avoid command line tools. And so DD you can use, um, but it doesn't create a hash value. It doesn't give you any feedback. These special forensic versions of DD add those features to it and came from the DOD and the Defense Cybercrime Center. They're just DD with a few extra features to like make another file with some hash values in it. I mentioned this before. The auto mounting is a problem. During boot up, your operating system will write to every disk and modify and corrupt your data. So that's rude, and that's why hardware write blocker is your best defense. But you can, if you're super cheap, use a forensic 
Linux disk instead, and it will, as long as it works, be as good. And Case is got lots of tools to make these images right there in Windows. It's got some command line utilities also, and even a in case Linux disk if you want. Um, you know, in case is a huge expensive suite to answer every problem. They're like Microsoft Office. They're not kidding. They want you to pay, and then you have everything you need to do everything. That's their goal. Anyway, then of course there's live duplication, which is far more directly relevant to us for most of the evidence we're going to be collecting here. If you do a live image, recording a system while it is on or in use, then the data is changing while you measure it. That's called a smear. So some files will be in a strange condition, like part of the edits, not all the edits. But this may be your only option. For encrypted drives, for example, where if you turn off the OS, it loses the encryption key and all turns into unreadable junk. All you can do is image it while it's live. Um, or machines that are on while you're imaging them. So again, uh, times that this, this happened to you, Sam, where you oh, ended up with a smear. Uh, well, I've done this for this reason. I've done it a few times. I've done it on things like uh, on Macs. On Macs, I was forced to do this because uh, there was no way to uh, connect to the hard drive or to get the RAM. To get the evidence from RAM, all I had to do was run command line utilities. Did you overcome it, or were you just... Smiling? I did not overcome it. I just I accepted an inferior collection, where all I did was run a script and get what the script would get me. So you only get the live processes and the live files. That's all I was able to do. And that's what you often have to do. You do what you can, and then record. Here's what I did, because the other thing was not available. Um, and so, if you're doing live imaging, there's, of course, no write blocker. You are changing the system. So you might cause performance problems for people using it, and so on. So be aware of this. It's got some limitations, but within those limitations, you're getting some data. Apple is a problem. The components are integrated, especially things like the MacBook Air. It's hard to take apart, hard to remove the drive. Um, what's easier is to connect uh, in target disk mode. Apple machines have the ability to boot into target disk mode, and then they're like an expensive USB hard drive. You can read and write to the drive directly and image it. Used to be over FireWire ports, now you can image it over the modern faster ports. So you can actually image it that way. That's pretty cool. And you can buy a write blocker for FireWire anyway, and I suppose there are write blockers available for the newer things like uh, whatever I'm using here. There's now USB-C, and then there's this thing here, Lightning. They're, I'm sure those things exist. I'm sure they're very expensive, too. Everything related to the Mac is always very expensive. Sam, if I were to guess, you're yeah. probably not good with uh, hacking uh, Macs. No. I see. Yeah. Thanks for being honest. Oh, sure. Macs are hard to hack. Yeah. Yeah. With Apple, um, so can you do this stuff even if they have a, like a secure enclave protection for the iPhones? Uh, well, the secure enclave, this is a very good question. The secure enclave on the iPhone is an area of memory that is not connected to the processor at all. It is not anywhere in the processor's address space. So no process running on the processor can copy the data from the secure enclave. So you cannot steal the data with any kind of software. The only thing you can do, uh, the only way, person I know that ever got data out of a secure enclave is Joe Grand, who did it by dissolving it with uh, acid for the equivalent Windows components, the, um, uh, the one on the motherboard of Windows machines, and reading it with a micro, uh, tiny little micro, microscopic electrical pin. That's the point. You, the only thing you can do with the secure enclave is you can send it a command, decrypt this block using the key. And it will do that, but you don't ever see the key. The key is hidden inside there. That's the idea. So if you store, um, say, credit card information in Apple Pay, it goes in the secure enclave on your iPhone, and that is considered very safe. There is no known way, as far as I know, for anybody to ever get the data out of the secure enclave. Once you beat the, the SCP, then you can get to the, the kernel and or the disk? Well, the kernel is in memory. You can get to that. The kernel in is on the disk also, the operating system files that boot up, and it's just a Linux kernel. So that's all right. The only thing in the secure enclave is cryptographic keys. That's usually all you put in there. But then that would be your gateway into you know, getting the whole machine, right? Oh, yes, if you could get them out. But as far as I know, there's no way to get them out. Yeah. It's a very good point. That's the whole point of it. And it's a trusted platform module in Windows that does the same thing. The special chip to hold your keys that is not addressed at all by the processor. So no software can use it. All it can do is send a command saying, use the key to decrypt this drive, use the key to encrypt this drive, and it can do that, but nobody can steal the key. That's the whole idea. And this is a military term. This came from the Navy. The Navy defined the standards, and they defined this thing called a trusted computing platform, and a trusted computing module was the necessary hardware component to meet the Navy standards. And it might add, uh, Mac, I'm um, first, Windows did it first in software, but Mac actually did it first in hardware. 
and now it's also on iPhones. And on the highest end Androids, I've been told, now have an equivalent device. So then you have these storage systems. This is what's really happening in big companies. You've got these big RAID arrays and storage area networks and network attack storage, which are many hard drives all spinning and connected in a complicated way. It's a complicated mess. Imaging these things directly would just create a huge bunch of data, which then has to be combined. Uh, typically, this is useless. It's far too much bother to try to image the whole thing. Typically, you just make a logical copy of the part you're interested in and forget about recovering deleted files on such a thing. Latency issue? Uh, it's not so matter, it's a matter of latency. It's a matter of, um, in the first place, legal issues. You probably don't have the right to capture all that data and also just the huge amount of labor involved to reconstruct it later. So it's usually not worth it. The virtual machines are just the opposite. If there's a virtual machine running on the server, it's very easy to get everything off it. Um, because virtual machines, as you know, are just about 10 files sitting in a folder. You can just copy that folder and you've got everything. You've got the RAM, you've got the hard drive. So it's just the opposite of those complicated data arrays. It's the simplest possible situation. Really very nice. We use quantum to overcome no, quantum, quantum uh, processing won't, isn't available, and it wouldn't do you any good here. It wouldn't solve this problem. However, if you had, here's like, you know, if you've ever seen virtual machines, this is, say, the Kali Linux virtual machine. It's just a series of hard disk files that add up to the hard drive, and then um, virtual memory up here, and then a few configuration files, and that's it. So if you just copy this whole folder, you've got an absolute copy of that state of the virtual machine. And if you suspend the virtual machine, it stops changing. You can even get an image of the memory and it'll stay the same. So, you know, that's a, a suspended virtual machine is essentially a forensic image right there. Really very nice. Yeah. Any special considerations if you have a multi-boot, multi-OS machine, like you have evidence in different bins and do you have to insulate it in any kind of way? Well, that is an issue. If you have a multi, if you have a multi-boot machine, um, like you have Windows and Mac, then if you didn't encrypt either of them, I guess there'd be no big problem. But if one of them was encrypted, which you could totally do, you could encrypt them both, and then you could only read them by booting into them. And if you booted into the Mac and did a live image, you wouldn't be able to read the Windows. If you booted into Windows, you wouldn't be able to read the Mac. So, and if you turned it off and imaged it, they'd both be garbage because they're both encrypted. Once again, Sam, the latency issues in that scenario? No, I don't, the time is not a big issue. Oh, um, the big issue is the, the encryption, that's the tough one. This is why the FBI gets such an attitude about encryption. If people start encrypting their stuff, especially if they do it the way Apple does it, which is very secure, then it becomes very, very difficult for any of these so traditional forensic encryption. techniques to work. So yeah? It, 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 encrypting and decrypting. Yeah. Is there any latency issues or is it... Oh, oh if you turn on encryption, uh, in principle, saving a file is slower and recovering a saved file is slower, but in practice, the difference is so small you don't notice it. Oh, I see. Back in the days of Windows XP, people did complain that their encrypted hard drives made the machine run too slowly. Modern machines, you don't notice it. I see. And now I understand the question. All right, good. Anyway, I got another set of cahoots, <coughs> and then I want to talk about some projects. I got a new one, and I want to talk about some ones you've already had to do. Uh, let's look at another cahoot here. And I appreciate you sticking to your question. I want to make sure and answer it. So if I you don't get a good enough answer, complain. All right, so which software is in almost every Linux box? All right, DD is what you get. All right, included in every Linux distribution. All right, which one is free Windows software? All right, the FTK Imager is free, you've used it. All right. Which one will let you make a valid forensic image just by copying a few files? All right. And that's a virtual machine. Makes it very easy. And one more here. Which one is particularly useful on Macs? All right, that's the target disk mode. You'd be consigned for this. Uh, don't run away. I think rather than take a break, I'll just finish up here because this is going to be pretty easy. Because I'll only take a few minutes to say what I'm reading stuff I want to say, which is two projects. Uh, the one which one student told me they were doing for tonight might be due tonight. Let's see. Today is uh, six. Yeah, today, dude, one is due tonight, as she just mentioned. Some people are having trouble, although I checked it again. It seemed to work fine. But I realized I hadn't perhaps talked about it in class, and it is important. The registry is where you get a lot of this information on Windows. Uh, the point, Windows 
Now, almost all forensics consists of finding evidence that people did not mean to leave behind. There's even some criminologist law that anytime anybody enters a space, they leave traces behind, and every time they leave a space, they carry evidence with them. This is their rule. I don't, it's not a mathematically perfect rule, but it's a rule in practice. And your computer is recording everything you do, not deliberately. Now, you can put surveillance software on a machine, but even if you don't, Windows by itself does a ton of surveillance just for the, its normal operation, for things like making it run faster and making it remember what you've done to offer you more frequently used items. It keeps a lot of records of what you're doing, and that's what forensic people do, is look for the records that are accidentally left. So in the registry, the registry is stored in these hive files. It is a very strange thing. The registry is a big tree-structured mess and it's stored in a whole bunch of files all over the place. And some of these files apply to the whole machine and are shared by all of them, like the hardware hive that's recreated every time you reboot. But the, a lot of them depend on the current user, like um, the ntuser.dat. Each user has their own ntuser.dat. And those are the personalizations that will only take effect when you log in, because it knows who you are. So you boot up the machine, and a bunch of these hives take effect to start the machine. And then when you log in, more hives take effect, and they all go into the registry. And the registry is there, is Microsoft's giant database to replace the previous system where every product had its own uh, config files. Um, like originally it was autoexec.bat and win.ini, and then a lot of config files like apache.conf and all that. And Linux still uses that system. Every tool has its own configuration files in text files, and you have to find them. And there's no unifying format. And Microsoft decided to gather it all into the registry, for better or worse. And there are several registry keys you have to learn in the world of forensic because they are very useful. So the first thing is to collect the registry. You do FTK, and you get everything, password recovery, and all registry files. This will give you enough information to reconstruct the whole registry, including stored passwords. And you can, in fact, recover password hashes from registry images and then crack them with hacking tools. And the uh, expensive forensic tools like FTK and Encase will attempt to do that. And they will successfully crack weak passwords. Strong passwords, like 12-character random passwords, cannot be cracked by anything. But most passwords that people actually use can be cracked pretty easily because people aren't really that imaginative. And they pretty much use the same passwords, just the name of a famous band followed by a number or something. Anyway. Um, so each user has their own, here's the overall system files that you'll see, like SAM and security and system. And then if you show the hidden files, you can go in and see the ntuser.dat. And the ntuser.dat has the personalized files. And this tool, Registry Explorer, is fantastic. I, you know, students used to have to hunt for this stuff the hard way. But Registry Explorer not only finds like the most popular 20 things you want to find in the registry. You, it, Sam. Uh, you just go to this tab. Load this tool and go to this tab. It'll automatically show you the most popular stuff. It also makes it readable. These things are obfuscated by Windows, like the uh, typed URLs are obfuscated with ROT13, which is ridiculously poor encryption. But this tool automatically reverses it. So you can see um, here's the uh, URLs that have been typed in to when, Internet Explorer. Once you're there, what, what do you do? Uh, you open the registry file, and then here you can just see the evidence. And forensic tools do this all automatically. But this, this tool does just the registry bit. Yeah. Just to let you know that the version I downloaded uh, yeah. seems to have been an updated version for yeah. what's uh, on the, uh, the yeah. instructions. And it doesn't show you the type URLs window. Oh, it doesn't. They took it away. At least for mine, it did. Oh, OK. I had some students complaining. So I just redid it like before class, and it still worked. OK, there must be a new version which they broke. I will take a look. Thanks for telling me. So type URLs didn't come up. Of course, another thing that might happen is if you haven't actually typed them into Internet Explorer, they won't be here. You know, it really, it's not kidding about typed URLs. If you click on a link or you open them in Firefox, they don't go there. You have to actually type it in the URL bar. Or actually, can you scroll down uh, a bit? I think it might have been up down. I think actually, no, it was user assist, I'm sorry. User what assist has to be there. One of these. Somebody was telling me they couldn't find user assist, and I don't understand that at all. User assist is the most important thing. In fact, this is the first thing, by the way, I should tell you this from my favorite forensic teacher. The first thing you do whenever you get a machine is you image the hard drive, then you look in the registry, and you look in user assist because user assist records every USB device that has been plugged in forever. Yeah. And the reason it does is because if you plug in a thumb drive, and then next week you plug it in again, it wants to remember, I already have the driver. I don't need to download the driver again. So it records it. So it records every drive that's been plugged in, serial number oh, okay. and model, and it records it forever. Wh and which tool, sir? 
Uh, anything that lets you see the registry. This is one of them. Uh, Reg Ripper will do it too. Registry Explorer is this Sam, one. Yeah. Sam, I remember what it was. Yeah. It was the program name that it wouldn't let you see. Program data? The program name. So on the user assistant. Oh, the program name is gone? Show you the value name, but it would show you the program name. Well, that's rude. Yeah. Um, is the version we downloaded, Sam? Yeah. I think yeah. it probably the one I downloaded was just missing the tab for user assist, but I was able to look inside the yeah. list of value names and find the one that you indicated. Okay. It, it was just probably the version I downloaded. I probably didn't find it. So it sounds like they broke the latest version. This, by the way, is extremely common with free tools. Uh, like Colleague, for example, they update it, and every time they update it, they break a whole bunch of things, and they don't seem to notice. Just whatever they think is important keeps working. So um, maybe I'll have to get the old version of this and put it on my site, because this, unfortunately, is true of people that use free tools. You often have to archive the old version that works because the new version breaks everything. Right. It's kind of rude. This is the kind of thing that a lot of people do not want to try to explain in court. That's why they like to pay a pile of money and get official cool, like in case, that will not have this kind of stupidity. <laughs> And if you are going to use free tools and then go to court, you better be able to explain this and make it sound like you're not an idiot. But anyway, um, anyway. But is it often that you would screenshot like your images and then submit them as part of your report to the court or something? Uh, no, usually not a screenshot because it's not professional. If that's another thing. You pay those tools for to make beautiful PDF reports. Oh, okay. so management. <laughs> so that's, screenshots make you look clumsy. So again, if you're going to do that, you gotta be More so like you gotta be so impressive. I know some people that go to court and they're totally open source guys and they write their own scripts and everything and they're such geniuses they impress people and win. But you know that said, Sam, what's effective if it's not a screenshot? Oh, um, beautiful looking PDF, official professional things well, with a logo and, and a header. Just see in the corner. Uh, <laughs> you know, sure. you know, the same thing in impresses management. Same thing you wear you wear a suit and Sorry. stuff. It's all presentation. Presentation will right. compensate for you can often have Stupid stuff, but presented well, and you win. And that's why. That's why criminals always wear suits. Well, you have to, otherwise you get contempt of court. But yeah, the, the lawyers. Uh, when I went to the Bolt Law School at UC Berkeley, I felt like I was at a TV show with models. They were so dressed up, beautiful hairstyle, expensive clothes. It was daunting, but apparently they really took to heart a lesson that you got to dress up. This is why I heard the uh, one of the criticisms of a guy. I think again, Kavanaugh, or no, one of the other. They said you have to. Uh, women have to dress up to be his assistant or something, and um, and they the look one, like models. And one of the lawyers said, "Yeah, but that is standard advice." And as far as I can tell, that is standard advice for lawyers. They tell you, you got to look like a runway model. They seem to take it real seriously. I guess they think they're going to win more in court, and maybe it's true. I don't know. Sam, that made sense. It did. Image. So that's a beauty and brains, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I think you know they. They think looking better will make you win. Anyway, so this is what I wanted to show you. This is the um, glorious ROT 13. So, I'll um, tell you what, Sam, when I, uh, when I yeah. uh, worked in Japan, yeah. uh, I didn't absolutely uh, have my technical act together, but I dressed nice and I, you know, I, I, I got contracts over, oh, yes. over and over again just by wearing a good suit. So I understand what yes. you're saying. And I've had another student who would tell me the same thing. He was not very technical, but the technical companies hired him in Japan because he knew the rules of politeness in Japan. And they're not obvious at all. And if an average American businessman walks into a meeting, he will offend the other side and lose the contract because you didn't know the right way to address people and bow and do the right. And it really matters. You have to know the right formalities. Sim, here's what I'm thinking. That, you know, being in court, uh, you know, uh, having a good uh, flashy PDF. Yeah. Because they're not going to understand. That's right. They're not going to understand. That's exactly right. So these expensive tools make beautiful things. Anyway, here's the ROT 13. So Notepad turns into A, B, G, R. It's just moving every letter 13 steps in the alphabet. That's Microsoft attempting to protect your privacy. Anyway, um, so that's the game here. Then there's recent docs. It shows you the recently opened documents, which is uh, just so you can more easily find it in your recent uh, document list. And the current control set is real important. You, when you um, Windows machines have this thing called hardware profiles. I haven't seen anybody actually use them since Windows 2000, but they're in there. You can, in principle, plug in a different keyboard and a different monitor, and it will boot to a different hardware setup with a different set of drivers. So it stores that as a different control set, like control set 001, control set 002. The current control set is where all the things you need 
about the registry are, but there is no nothing in your registry image called current control set because these are the only things stored on the hard disk. And when you boot up, it probes the hardware during the post process and decides which of these you're in and uses it. So to find out which one is current, you have to go here and see which one is current. It's one, and therefore this is the current control set when this registry image was taken. So if you want to use registry keys that are in current control set, where a lot of the important ones are, you have to go through this process first to figure out which of the control sets was current when this image was taken. This is an important fact. Another thing, which I don't think I put in here, which is super important, is to check the time zone. Because a fairly common thing criminals do do is change the time zone to obscure the time they did the crime. So you have to check and see if it's been changed. Anyway, then there's USB store. This is what I wanted to mention. Um, checking USB store is super important because when, the, when you get a, hard, a computer to analyze, for the first thing you do is look at USB store and see what other USB devices have been connected to this, and then write another court order to demand those two, because those are also evidence. And that's why this is the first thing you do is go to USB store, find out what's been plugged in, then tell your client that so they can ask for more evidence, and then analyze this one while they're getting more evidence. Because then a court order. Yeah, because, well, it depends on how you wrote the first well, one. How do you write it? Oh, you, you have a court order that says, um, I like a search warrant, that says I'm going to get the evidence here. And if you now find more devices that would be connected to this at the time of interest, then you should ask for them too because they probably have relevant evidence. Does the court can understand the court order? Oh, oh, all they'll say is the forensic examiner has determined that there was also a USB device connected to this, like this, this model, this serial number, and we want you to see that too. I wouldn't know, know how to write this court order. Oh, oh I, don't, I don't see a problem. I mean, it's a search warrant. You specify what you want. Um, and, uh, Do you just go down a, a file from a, a hierarchical file, file order? No, no. You just go here and find the readable stuff, which is going to, I hear, Kingston Data Travel to USB device. You get a, and you tell them, we need that device. There is a device that was plugged into this recently of this type. We need it. You wouldn't, this would just be in like an appendix, the details of exactly how we determined that that was the device. But the only part that a judge will ever read is the first page, which says this brand, this model of device, we forensic examiner found that that was connected to the computer and we need that too. That's reasonable. I see. Yeah, that's all. Anyway. Thanks, sir. Yeah, good. So that's what I wanted to tell you about that one. And I just wanted to mention the new one, which is Yara. I promised you Yara. And Yara turned out to be very easy. The first several times I tried to get Yara working, it was miserable because I was trying to use Linux. Yara works very well on Windows, which is <laughs> something I don't find very often. Usually Windows is worthless. But in this case, the Windows screw works. And that's the, it's very easy to use on Windows. So just to go here and download Yara, unzip it, and then you're ready to go. So make a working folder. You'll find this a directory of Yara in your downloads after you unzip it. And then put it in a folder called C Yara to have a place to work. And so now, uh, you should get the 32 or 64-bit version appropriate for your machine. <laughs> I used the 64-bit Windows Server 2016 that we, we prepared if you've been following my projects the way I wrote them. And so now you can run Yara. And here, now, the way Yara works, it is incredibly simple. It's really nothing more than just basically grep. All it does is look for strings in the file. The only advantage is it has a formal structure to write rules that are a little more complicated, but they're no more complicated than regular expressions. Therefore, by the way, Yara is in fact pretty lame. Any kind of obfuscation will stop it. Any kind of encryption will stop it. It only looks for sequences of bytes in files. So it is considered pretty weak. And the same thing is true of Snort. Snort has the same limitation. They really can only do very superficial scans, like the old email filters that look for words like Viagra and stuff. They, they're not going to really catch anything that is hiding at all. But they're going to catch things that are just in plain sight. So here's the simplest rule I could make. This is going to look for the string evil. So this is what a YAR rule looks like. You have the name of the rule, you define strings, and then your condition is that string is there. You can have multiple conditions, and you can have or or and and all that jazz, but you can just have one condition, which is it has that string. So that rule will trigger if it finds a file containing the word evil. So now you create a couple files, good in one file, evil in the other file. And when you run Yara, it will, it will find the one that contains evil. So it's very simple. Um, so that's, that's the simplest thing. So the next thing, get a couple files to get. You should download this Minesweeper file I made for another class, just a handy uh, executable file. And then you're going to copy um, another file calc over. So once you've done that, 
Um, then go to get some real YAR rules. You can download YAR rules just like SNART rules. People put them on the web. I found this GitHub repository all full of them. So here's somebody's uh, had a whole bunch of YAR rules here. And this particular one is one that analyzes executable files and tells you a lot of things about them. So I thought that would do for starters. So save this thing on your disk as um, hacker compiler signatures yar dot yar. So you put that in there, and now you can run yar on that. And when you run packer compiler signatures against your test directory, it will trigger on these executables, which I put calc there and mine sam there, and it will find various things. This is PE64, this is PE32, these are Windows GUIs, these has debug data, this is packed, and so on. They have signatures. There's various facts it finds about these files by finding certain patterns of bits in them. So that's all. And there are a whole bunch of things you can scan for all different kinds of malware with Yara, and it is very commonly done. And the next thing is you might want to learn how to write your own Yara rules, which I thought is probably not really essential for this class, so I made it extra credit. So I gave you another set of files. This was kind of fun. I wrote a little script, made 100 files full of junk. And you have to go through those files and um, find the, first find the ones that contain evil, and then find the ones that contain um, four, three bytes of zero, four in a row, and then find the ones that contain a byte of four, three to six bytes of anything, a byte of five, three to six bytes, and a byte of six. And there's links here to go to the tutorials to learn how to write that kind of Yara rule. Yeah? Is it similar to regular expressions? Or is it, similar? Uh, you, it is very much like regular expressions. It's essentially just another way to write regular expressions, <coughs> or start rules, essentially just regular expressions. And the real art of both of them is to write them in a way that doesn't slow down the machine too much. When I wrote the one to find this, it complained, this is going to slow down your machine. Of course, for this simple directory with only 100 files, you can still get to the end. But it is very common that when people start using snort, you write a rule, and the rule slows down the box to crawl. But it can't do two different, same thing with grep. Complicated greps will slow down your machine. Yeah? Uh, in a production environment, would you just have this scripted to run at a certain time and then check? Or? It's a good question, and I never, don't know exactly how people really use it. Um, I. Uh, I haven't seen real use cases of how it's actually used. I know it's the standard in the business, though. People talk about YARA rules all the time. I think the ones I've seen are ad hoc and instant response, where you have stuff, something bad has happened, now you want to scan for stuff in here, so you download a bunch of YARA rules and analyze this, sort of like offline antivirus scans. Um, as far as doing it continually live, I haven't heard of that, but there might be somebody doing that. I think, essentially, you'd be better off using an antivirus product, which is essentially the same thing, plus more bells and whistles. Which, which antivirus? Oh, well, that's a tough question. Um, uh, all the antiviruses are extremely ineffective because they all suffer from a problem like this that it's easy to sneak past them. Uh, people tell me the commercial ones like McAfee and Norton are a little better. The most technically accurate is Kaspersky, but it has a political problem, and all your data is going to Russia. Yeah, I, so that's why yeah. we're not recommended anymore. Trend um, Micro's not bad. It doesn't take too much resource. Uh, trend Mi yeah, Trend Micro's okay. The free ones are pretty good, but people say the commercial ones are a little better. Nod32 is very highly rated. And I think it comes from Britain. So it's also not a huge political sure, problem. Firewall Incorporated? Firewall what? Oh, oh they, many of you include a host and endpoint protection <coughs> firewall as well. I don't know anything about how good those are. I get are. confused between the antivirus and the firewall where there's separation. So well, the firewall, the firewall blocks network traffic, and the antivirus primarily looks at disk space. But are they blocks. integrated now, or are they, they are. separate? Uh, the, the big products like Norton and McAfee integrate the two into an endpoint protection suite, and the enterprise products like uh, Carbon Black integrate it all with your... So I need to talk to you. I, I've got about 100 endpoints i gotta, uh, I got to protect right now, and I'm just confused. Yeah, well, I'm not, I don't know the enterprise. I know the enterprise class people. I've heard of Carbon Black. Other people here may have good tips. I don't know. Uh, all I know is the cheap stuff. I know the enterprise people have to have a main controller, logging it all and such. Yeah. About the Palo Alto one. Well, Palo Alto is the best firewall, but it's not an endpoint protection. It's the opposite. It protects your whole network. You have one Palo Alto to protect your whole company, and that's important. But it's not endpoint protection. It's company uh, enterprise class firewall. I rest my case, Sam. I'm confused. Well, you need defense in debt. You have a, an enterprise class firewall blocking stuff coming in from the internet, and then you have something running on every desktop to detect stuff that gets through this, that people download from emails and such. And that could be something like Norton or McAfee, um, or like say other big corporations use these other things. So it's two, yeah. two separate solutions. Then, yes. Right? Yes. And you do need. Yes, my question. And you typically need both of them. 
You need defense in depth these days because all the defenses are pretty weak, so you have layers of them. All right. Anyway, that's all I wanted to show you. Um, I'm going to clean up and go up to the lab and help anybody that wants to work here.